so I'd like to keep my presentation succinct to the occupational aspects of pneumoconiosis. My whole idea of today's presentation is how we can promote health surveillance and talk about health surveillance on exposures in the workplace, specifically asbestos and silica. Uh, so, uh, so let's move on and uh, talk about what health surveillance is in the first place. Uh, health surveillance, it's hard to define. Uh, it is mandatory by law. Uh, with certain occupational health practices where toxins, carcinogens, and employees are exposed to various hazards in the worst place that can increase the risk for cancer or other comorbidities and diseases. So health surveillance can be described, if you may say, as the systemic and ongoing tracking and forecasting of population level health status, events, outcomes, risk slash protective factors or other determinants through the collection, integration, analysis, and interpretation. So this is the most important part, collection of data from your workers for the health surveillance, integration of that data and analysis from an epidemiological perspective, a preventative perspective, and interpretation of that data, how you can use that in your workplace for improving the general health and well-being and also preventing or reducing uh, the level of exposure within the acceptable uh, limits as promoted by Save Work Australia. Um, and if you continue on, the timely dissemination of this information of those who need to know in order to inform action. So uh, that probably just gives you a quick summary of what health surveillance is and uh, I'll probably move on uh, to asbestos. Uh, asbestos, as you know, uh, is quite a common topic in Australia. It's quite prevalent. Uh, I'll probably start off with what pneumoconiosis is. Uh, pneumoconiosis is a group of chronic lung conditions caused by long-term exposure to respirable particles. And when we're talking about particles, we're talking about particles which are really small in size, uh, less than five micrometer in diameter. For them to be inhaled, go all the way down your respiratory system into the alveoli and be deposited. Um, uh, so bigger particles can be easily filtered through our ear, nose, throat, uh, through our nose and throat, uh, but smaller particles can be lodged in, and we're talking about mineral dust. Uh, the classical features of pneumoconiosis normally involve deposition of these mineral dust fibers, particles into the alveoli or the airbags uh, through which we breathe. Um, and then they are taken over and eaten by macrophages, which are white blood cells, uh, with ca causing localized inflammation, causing a reaction with inflammation, fibrosis, necrosis, formation of nodules and cavitation, and uh, leading into progressive parenchymal disease, uh, which we get to see in pneumoconiosis. And the overall bigger picture is that we see people who are wheezing, struggling with shortness of breath. Uh, the types of pneumoconiosis or diseases that we see in occupational backgrounds in healthcare workers would in include a variety of conditions, including Cold work and pneumoconiosis, as you would normally see with the coal mines we have in New South Wales and Queensland. Uh, and the whole idea of health surveillance in coal mines is to prevent uh, the incidence of coal workers' pneumoconiosis. Of course, asbestosis and silicosis is something I will highly stress on today's presentation. Uh, other conditions that you get to see with other mineral dust and particles include Bereliosis uh, with beryllium, or with tin or uh, exposure to stenosis, iron leading to siderosis. Uh, so they are quite phenomenal, uh, you know, with the same uh, name, shape, stenosis, siderosis, uh, baritosis, uh, you get to see with exposure to various minerals. So uh, let's come to asbestosis and talk about asbestos itself. 
Uh, asbestos, as you know, is uh, uh, a fiber that was quite widely used and probably still is in the third world uh, with construction. Uh, and exposures are from various places. Uh, asbestos fiber inhalation causes asbestosis, uh, which is characterized by chronic pulmonary interstitial fibrosis. Um, the problem with this uh, exposure is that the effects are not imminent, direct, or obvious in the immediate uh, uh, time post-exposure, and there's a latency period of 25 to 40 years. Uh, so um, uh, there's obviously a clear dose-response relationship with the amount of exposure uh, that leads to asbestosis. Uh, it presents with shortness of breath, cough, uh, crepitations, uh, finger clubbing, uh, there's an increased synergistic effect uh, when asbestos fiber and smoking can increase the rate of asbestosis and cancer. Um, the diagnosis is usually undertaken by clinical imaging, lung function test, and smoking is actively advocated in workplaces where asbestos exposure is obvious. Uh, of course, using appropriate PPE, personal protective equipment is highly necessary, especially when we see people who are undertaking renovations, uh, especially in the olden suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, you see people, small industry uh, and small businesses undertaking asbestos, uh, asbestos exposure exercises where they're renovating, changing old clad pipes, or doing demolition work without using appropriate equipment. Uh, we have seen smaller pockets of increased incidence of asbestosis because of these activities. Uh, the clinical diagnosis is based on lung function, the clinical symptoms, and also the chest X-ray findings. The, the exposure is generally through inhalation, so respiratory protection is the main way to tackle and avoid exposure to the asbestos fiber. Uh, it's not easy to get the asbestos fiber into your lung waste to its considerable level to lead to cancer. Uh, it has to be in a dry form, which can be inhaled. Normally techniques these days would use water down or wetting techniques where materials which need to be cut, removed or disposed of are wetted down with water in order to reduce the impact of fibers or the concentration of fibers in the air. Um, and uh, with asbestos-related diseases, what we normally get to see is mesothelioma, pleural thickening or pleural flux, pleural effusion, uh, which is thickening of the lining of the lungs, uh, inflammation uh, around the lungs, and also cancer of the lungs or even the larynx. Uh, activities and occupations that normally lead to exposure uh, would involve dockyards, shipbuilding, shipbreakers, fitters, railway engineering, uh, asbestos textile industry, construction, pipe lagging, thermal insulation, pipe fitters, asbestos mining distribution, uh, um, engineering, brake linings and clutch faces. Uh, so a lot of these ac activities, and as I mentioned earlier, demolition, renovation of all buildings, asbestos insulation, lagging and roof tiles. Uh, the prevention for asbestos is mainly elimination. Uh, so the placement of asbestos with other material, which has been quite obvious now and actively practiced uh, in Australia. Nevertheless, there are still old constructions and sites around, especially uh, when you see an old school being renovated or expanded, that you get to see uh, that there are uh, incidents where asbestos sheets have been discovered and a full public health intervention has to be taken place in order to educate parents and also how to prevent further exposure and limit the activities of these asbestos sheets or fibers from old school buildings 
or old school sites uh, during weekends or at times where uh, school is not active. Um, so health surveillance uh, is normally undertaken for uh, by law uh, for all workers in Australia according to Safe Work Australia guidelines. Health surveillance, which is uh, monitoring uh, the impact of asbestos related work or removal work, has to be undertaken before, during, and after. Uh, exposure to asbestos is uh, monitored during any activity, but uh, a pre entry and an exit examination needs to be undertaken. And this is usually undertaken in order to see if they have any difference. Uh, in Australia, there are different types of fibers, including white asbestos, blue asbestos, and brown or gray asbestos. So, um, depending upon the type of fiber and the work activity, we can um, determine uh, the risk of exposure, the level of exposure and the impact. Um, it's normally dependent on the type, size, shape, the concentration and exposure of the fiber, uh, and whether it's enough to be airborne. Uh, inhalation is the primary route uh, into the lungs, um, and it's normally dependent upon uh, the the high aspect ratio of the fiber, which usually mentioned as the ratio of aspect ratio three to one. Nevertheless, um, other environmental exposures from uh, asbestos include environmental debris, the cement sheets and roofing, and wall cladding, disturbance of asbestos from a variety of building materials like insulation, ceiling tiles, and floor tiles. Uh, and asbestos released to air from factories and brakes in cars and trucks, resulting in asbestos fibers being widespread in the environment. Uh, so there may be incidental exposures, but the main concern that we get to see these days is, <clears throat> excuse me, the anxiety that comes around with exposure. And people tend to become really stressed about it, especially parents, uh, with young kids uh, going to school um, or workers who have been inadvertently or accidentally being exposed. Uh, and that's usually a concern. Um, practice and managing and educating in these scenarios and exposures is very important during the health services process. Um, the, Specific terminologies that we get to use with asbestos, including plural plaques, uh, benign asbestos pleural fusion, pleural fibrosis, cross feed picture or atelectasis, uh, which is collapse of uh, borders of the lung. Um, on examination, normally we see people who are coughing, have crackles, have uh, certain opacities. Uh, on their x-rays. You can see on the picture, uh, the pro plaque uh, shows up as a thickened uh, and hardened uh, pleura, as you can see over here. Uh, and similarly with lung cancer, they can come around as spots um, and can lead to scarring of the lung tissue. Uh, mesothelioma is the other variety we get to see with cancer of the pleural coverings. Uh, asbestos is an IARC uh, level one carcinogen, so it's high up there, number one. Uh, and normally, um, to remember the least for asbestos, it's important to know that it has a long latency uh, period, up to 40 years, which can be cut down by smoking and spirometry. Uh, which is lung function test in a simpler form, and chest x-ray if indicated, are the usual pathways of how to intervene and monitor. The mesothelioma register is another uh, database that contains information about people with mesothelioma in Australia. 
uh, mesothelioma, interestingly, can be in the pleura around the lungs or even in the peritoneal area in the abdomen, which is probably not that common. Um, all cases of mesothelioma are recorded on the register in Australia. Uh, normally, when I get to see a case for asbestosis, I would like to know about their occupational history, irrespective of the work that they're going to do in other places that they're going to be, how many years have they been working there, the level of exposure they've had, the type of respirators they've used, half mask, full face mask, uh, P2, 3, or P1, or a simple white mask, uh, and also uh, what type of measures did they have? Did they have a full body white suit? Uh, uh, did they have any special cleaning equipment? Did they have shower in and out before they got in? Uh, and also other protection for their hands, for their eyes, and for their overall body. Did they have any disposable protective garments, and how were they disposed of? Did they have any as asbestos fibers vacuum from work clothes with an asbestos vacuum cleaner? So an asbestos vacuum cleaner comes with a HEPA filter. Uh, and um, and whether their footwear, the shoes were wiped prior to leaving the asbestos work area or they took the same shoes back to their carpets at their home. Uh, so these are general measures which are really important. Age, height, blood pressure, and general vitals are normally examined. Uh, but the most important part with the respiratory testing is to see their forced vital capacity, how much air they can blow out, at, uh, at maximum, how much air they can quickly get out in one minute, FEV1, and what's the ratio between the two. Uh, it's important to know what practices and education were carried out in the workplace, and this is the standard norm for health surveillance that we get to see in the workplace, uh, which is really crucial uh, for practice. So I'll probably move on uh, uh, to uh, the next uh, slide. Um, um, so here we have more pictures uh, uh, and uh, we can see the different types of asbestos as well uh, over here and uh, uh, you can see the different colors and how they impact uh, and press onto the lungs when you get asbestosis um, and where we can find asbestos uh, in old houses, so they could be in the sliding, they could be in the ceilings. Uh, they were fantastic for insulation years ago. Uh, they could be in the roofing felt, uh, they could be in your uh, basement, they could be door gaskets, they could be used for pipe insulation uh, or block insulation, uh, and they could be used in various other places as well. So uh, I would like to just go on and uh, go to the next slide. Uh, sorry, I can't get rid of these annotations for some reason. I'll see if I can. Uh, yep, there you go. I got rid of them. Uh, so the next topic I would like to talk about is um, uh, silica. Uh, silica is another very common pneumoconiosis in Australia with a similar root inhalation, it's a level one carcinogen, which leads to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, renal disease, and um, is monitored the same way uh, with spirometry and chest x-ray. As you can see, uh, uh, it can uh, go into alveolar sacs and present with uh, shortness of breath fever, cyanosis, which is low oxygen levels, and presents as fatigue, extreme shortness of breath, uh, uh, loss of appetite, chest pain. Uh, industries that are at high risk would involve construction, mining, sandblasting, uh, masonry. Uh, so get, to give you a better idea what silica is and where it comes from, silica, uh, silicosis uh, is associated with exposure to respirable crystalline silica. And silica is mainly uh, uh, encountered from crystalline quartz, which is a component of our rocks. Um, it also presents with a long latent period as well. Uh, we could see people who are working in tunnel, as tunnel drillers, blasters, roof bolters, 
transportation crew, uh, people working on the quarries, uh, doing blasting, cutting, and transporting stone pieces, stone masonry workers, stone uh, uh, granite dressing and grinding, heavy engineering, short blasting, um, uh, and foundries where you see sand molding, short blasting, ceramic and pottery work, or brick workers. Uh, so that's where you normally get to see the exposure uh, with crystalline silica. Uh, we get to see it in excavation, earth moving, and also in clay and stone processing machine operations, uh, paving and surfacing, uh, uh, construction labor activities. Abrasive blasting is another very common source which is underlooked. Um, the Monitoring for silica is pretty much similar uh, with asbestosis, although the clinical manifestation uh, is different. Um, uh, we get to do a similar baseline assessment for health surveillance with work history, medical history, investigations, uh, and also check during exposure to a crystalline silica process. Um, chest X-ray and pulmonary function test undertaken. Uh, at the termination and prior to the work job as well. Uh, silica uh, enters through inhalation and the impact is noted to be seen on lungs as a carcinogen, it causes lung cancer, silicosis, and also kidney disease as well as seen on epidemiological studies. Uh, over time, there can be an increased build of connective tissue of, leading to silicosis uh, uh, and can result in problems with breathing, shortness of breath. Uh, it presents in different forms of silica, like you can see in this X-ray. You can see all those nodules. It could be simple nodular silicosis or it could be progressive masses. Fibrosis, fibrosis all across the lung fields. Uh, it could present as an accelerated or an acute silica form as well. And as you can see with these workers, they're wearing uh, PPE while they're undertaking uh, granite grinding and concrete grinding, and they've got their PPE on. It's really important that they've got that good contact between the face and, uh, uh, and between the mask so there's no gap on the ends of the nose on the chin if they got a beard or the maxillofacial structure doesn't fit into the shape of their respirator so all these factors are really important um, the chronic effects of silicosis as we get to see is uh, uh, is really interesting uh, because it's one of those cases where you get to see that there's an increased risk of tuberculosis as well with silicosis that it's seen on epidemiological evidence. And other conditions as rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, erythematosis, and scleroderma. Uh, so uh, over time, these small nodules in the X-ray, as you can see, uh, combine together to form bigger clunks. Um, uh, it's a potential carcinogen. Uh, silica acts as an initiator. Uh, so it initiates the activity for these cancer forming cells to get bigger. Health surveillance is undertaken to avoid this altogether. And this is usually done by undertaking a proper history examination. So normally when cases like these come to me, I'll ask about their personal hygiene. It's really important to know if they've got bad practices like nail biting. Are they frequently hand washing before they go to the kitchen and have their... Uh, have their lunch or if they uh, smoke and do they wash their hands or they're putting everything on their lips. Uh, so it's really important to know the level of personal hygiene and also the type of work they do, uh, how much exposure there is, whether there's facility or appropriate respirator, if they've got appropriate local exhaust ventilation or general ventilation, the type of clothing uh, provided by work, the laundering undertaken, the wash patients, and showers and wet handling methods are used. So there's not much dust dispersed whenever there's cutting grinding activity. Very important question, are they clean shaven or not? And do they shower in and out at the end of the shift? Uh, chest x-rays are normally undertaken in order to monitor 
it's important to know what their activities are, are they able to climb stairs uh, without getting short of breath or wheezing or getting tiredness in their chest and any difficulty with breathing. So um, there's so many things uh, that can be done. We've only focused on asbestos and silica. I hope it has been of some help to you. Um,